All right, let's try now. Is our is that helping us? I'm a little bit ringy, but I can I can manipulate that. Is that better? Oh, we'll we'll tr we'll try this. Um, apologies for people losing sound. Um, and so that's one of our sets of numbers, right? Our other set of numbers comes from Judges 11. Wait, we're good. All right, we are back. So apologies for missing sound on on part of that. Uh, so our second number set of numbers come from Judges, uh, which basically uh, at the time of Jephthah, who we think is around 1100 uh, or 11th century, uh, basically says that 300 years the people have been wandering around. And so that would go us back to 1400, wandering in the wilderness for 80 years. We're somewhere around 1480. So our internal biblical math kind of puts us at around this date. And so traditional biblical scholars said, hey, this must be when we should look for the Exodus. Said everything has to hinge on the fact that at some point around 1200, our group of people who identify as Israel appear in Canaan, right? And this is our Stella. We looked at it in week one. The first mention of Israel in any written text, right? Our earliest mention of Israelites, they are in the land of Canaan. Maranepta has conquered Canaan, plundered in every sort. Ashkelon has been overcome. Gezer has been captured. You know him made non-existent. Israel is laid waste. His seed is not. Right? So somebody is there in 1219 for Maranepta to conquer. Here again is our text about Israel, indicated here as a group of people. That is our linchpin, right, for Israel showing up in Canaan. So that means, and depending on our time, is who are the pharaohs of the Exodus, right? Uh, and our problem is in the biblical text, it doesn't name names. Pharaoh is the pharaoh. Uh, and as we can imagine, saying the king did all this stuff, we could ask which one. A pharaoh is a title, not a name, and we don't know which one. Um, again, if historical, it has to be prior to or during the early reign of Merenepta. And so our most common attributions are going to be Ramses II, Seti I. So if you are familiar with any of your Hollywood accounts of uh, the Exodus, it's always Ramses II. Right? That is the choice of our Hollywood producers from Dynasty 19, uh, making assumptions of this later date for the Exodus sometime around 1250. But we don't know. And there are reasons that none of these fit particularly well. Uh, remember, we need two pharaohs. We need one of the oppression who starts oppressing the Israelites, who's going to die, right? Because Moses is going to run away. He's going to come back under a different pharaoh. So we need two. So it's often, again, a Seti the first, Ramses the second, maybe a Ramses the second, Maranepta, but nobody really knows. Why do we think it would be, if we're looking for a historical kernel, that this is going to be in the Ramesside period? Well, this has to do with geography, right? And so uh, we want to play a little bit of geography games because that's where we're looking for the context of the Exodus, right? The Israelites in Egypt fit a certain place. We know that they are, again, coming with their flocks and herds, and they show up, and according to uh, Genesis, under Joseph, they come and they say, hey, can we settle here. They say, come, bring your family. And they say, well, there's a problem. We have flocks and herds in our nomadic, and Egypt is all about farming that nice, good Nile inundation. There's no place for us here. And in fact, you don't like shepherds very much anyway. Uh, and they say, go live in the land of Goshen. It's good. It's a, a better place for uh, herding. And Goshen, as best we can tell, is around this area of the Wadi Tumalot. It's a, uh, Wadi is sort of this uh, empty riverbed that sometimes fills up seasonally. And this one runs off sort of the Nile Delta to the east into the Eastern Desert. It's good for grazing. It's good for shepherds. And if we start looking around the Wadi Tumalot, we find that a lot of the names of cities and sites around there are Semitic. They're not Egyptian. Egyptian is an Afroasiatic language, and these are Semitic, so languages similar to Hebrew. They're coming from a different type of place. Uh, and so we have uh, various cities here. That, so there's Semitic people living in this area who are farming and herding. Mostly herding, not as much farming. 
right? We can see this in, for example, a uh, papyrus from 1209 from Seti II, Papyrus Anastasi VI. And this one uses lots of Semitic loan words to refer to locations of the delta. In fact, this is common for this period, not just in this uh, papyrus, right? And so here we have part of the text. We've uh, been fishing aloud the Shasu. The Shasu are a group of nomadic, herding, pastoralists who frequently occupy this area, according to a number of uh, Egyptian texts. Uh, we've let them uh, plant the folk of Edom to pass the fort of Merenepta, that is in Cheku, to the pools of Piatum. The word for pools of Piatum is birkat. That's a Semitic term, right? That's, uh, that's similar to our Hebrew term for pools. That's not our Egyptian term, right? Uh, that are in Cheku to keep them alive and keep, uh, keep alive their livestock, right? We are letting people, these herdsmen and pastoralists, in to survive a famine, giving them water by our pools from the 12th century. This sounds a lot more like the situation we're seeing in the patriarchal narratives. Our Exodus account has the Israelites, right? A Pharaoh comes up who doesn't remember them. And so what do we do? We enslave them with heavy burdens. What are the heavy burdens we do? We have to build store cities, cities of Pitom and Ramses. That's one of our keys here. Before the Ramesside area, we're not building a city named after Ramses. Right? Ramses, the Ramesides are Dynasty 19, start showing up in around the 13th century. So any early date of the Exodus has us building cities to a future king. Generally understood to be the city of Piramessa. Piramessa has been identified as a number of different places. Um, uh, it's a royal residence of Ramses II. Um, at a, uh, a site between Kantir and Tel Adaba, and this is one of our ideas of where it might lie. This is our Wadi Tumalot from the other map running through here, so very close to that eastern desert where we think people like Israelites might have potentially been living. Pitom is harder to identify. Vitak uh, suggests Tel Adaba, which is also in this area, um, and then would also suggest that, remember for the Exodus, we are uh, eventually fleeing Egypt, we're crossing a sea that is magically parted and closes up, our Yam Suf, our Sea of Reeds, and he's going to suggest that these are the Bala Lakes, right, which would be right here, very much on the exit for fleeing Egypt to the east into the desert. So geographically, our Wadi Tumalat, our cities that we're building, our potential flight route uh, fit okay with a Ramazide era timing. Other people disagree. Don Redford says that these are all late sites from the Persian period, and they're just a historical memory, and has other identifications for them. Israel Finkelstein says that uh, if we look at the uh, conditions of the desert they're walking through, this best fits sort of our early Iron Age, and so slightly later dates. Um, but Bitak really says particularly uh, when P. Ramesse, our uh, city we're building, is in use, really fits a dynasty um, uh, 1920 context. So we have a situation. We uh, know that there are people who originate from somewhere either up here or out here who spend lots of time in here, right? This part of Egypt. Uh, so we know that there are people from Canaan, people from the desert living in Egypt uh, to various extents. We don't know that they're Israelites. We don't know how or when they go. They seem to come and go uh, somewhat as, uh, as they please. Uh, but this is sort of our one context. Uh, again, our biblical account has them leaving um, with the help of a number of miraculous uh, plagues afflicting the Egyptians, for which we can find no evidence because they are miraculous. And um, that's kind of the point of miraculous events. Um, and so uh, they're... they're, they're um, some literary instances there where a lot of the events are targeting traditional gods of Egypt and their operations of power. And so maybe more of a metaphor for the sovereignty of the Israelite God over the Egyptian gods uh, by attacking the fertility of the Nile um, and then the health of the citizens, things that the Egyptian gods are usually responsible for. 
But supposedly this is going to allow them to leave. They're going to cross their Yam Suf. Again, hypothetically, our Bala Lake's up here. And then they're going to wander around through the desert, eventually coming to a holy mountain at Mount Sinai, which you will find surprising. We have no idea where it is. Our traditional Mount Sinai is Jebel Musa, way down here in the Arabian Peninsula, which seems a really odd way to go if we're trying to get to Canaan. Other suggestions have been Jebel Sinbisher, uh, have been Jebel um, Hello, uh, El Krob, right, or Har Karkom, right? So we have a number of options people have suggested, but at the end of the day is we don't really know where Mount Sinai is. There are a number of big mountains sort of in the south. We know it's in the south in this sort of Arabia-esque type area, um, but not exactly where. So you can see here a number of different hypothesized routes for the Israelite wandering, uh, of which there is no evidence because it is a bunch of people wandering around in the desert, which, as we saw with Abraham, is not something archaeology is good at finding. Right? Uh, itinerant people wandering around in the desert is not our uh, specialty here. But this does fit into something else that we've considered in sort of trying to reconstruct where the Israelites come from. They clearly have a tradition that uh, of their God is a God of liberation, taking them out of Egypt. And they clearly have an idea, right? Two ideas. One idea is what we talked about with Abraham. My father was a wandering Aramean. We come from the north. We wandered down from somewhere in Haran and Ur, and we got to Canaan this way. But we have another tradition, which is we came up from the south, we came up from the east, we came up from the desert. And this has been formulated into what we call the Midianite hypothesis. The Midianite hypothesis basically says that, uh, remember with Abraham, we talked about Abraham worships a god called El, his special god called El, who in Exodus reveals himself to Moses and says, hey, I never introduced myself properly. This is my name. Call me by this name. I'm the Lord, right? And so this hypothesis says that this particular God is the God, a warrior storm God of the Midianites or Kenites. There are groups that are living in the desert. This is Midian right down around here. And so we know that Moses, right? Moses grows up in the Egyptian court and then he murders a guy. He has to run away. And where does he run away? He runs away to the desert. He runs away to Midian. He marries the daughter of a Midianite priest named either Jethro or Ruel, depending on which version of the text you're reading. And so we have this idea that Moses is connected to a group of people in the south and the east. His father-in-law is a priest associated with this group. And this is part of, and he comes back to the Israelites and says, you know the God that you've been worshiping, the one God? I have a name for him now, right? I know where this is coming from. And so we have this um, uh, connection to a God associated with these southeastern tribes, associated with themes of war and liberation, right? The Lord is a warrior. We are going to conquer the land. Uh, the Lord freed us from the Egyptians with a strong arm and mighty deeds. Right? This is a major theme of the Exodus. And our holy mountain is Sinai. This is an odd holy mountain for people living in Canaan. The highest mountain in Israel is Mount Hermon. Right? Our Canaanites have Mount Safon, which is up in sort of uh, the Lebanon area. Um, we have lots of potential high mountains, but our holy mountain is way off in the desert to the south. It's an odd place for us to locate it. But basically, the suggestion here is that the Israelites take this name, this properly named God, and they conflate it with the God of Abraham, our God that we called El, that, was our, that we worshipped uh, exclusively, uh, supposedly, in this early period. And so we have a syncretism, right? A meshing of different ideas that the God that we have and the God that you have are the same God. They've just gone by different names at different time periods, but they're actually the same one. There's some textual support for this. Within the Bible, we have um, texts that read like very archaic Hebrew. The language in them is old. Uh, the types of words they're using, the style they're using, is usually in forms of poetry. It shows up in a couple places. 
One of the most famous ones is the Song of Deborah in Judges 5. We don't need to know much about the context other than these texts are old, and there's a theme we see coming through it. That the God we know as the Lord comes from the south. Comes from either Edom or Seir or Teman or Mount Paran. They're all areas in the south and to the east. So in Judges 5, Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched uh, from the field of Edom, the earth quaked, the heavens also dripped, even the clouds dripped water. Storm God, warrior God from the southeast, marching up towards Canaan. Habakkuk 3, one of our early prophets from the 8th century. So again, some archaic language. God comes from Timon, the holy one from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens and the earth is full of his praise. Right, so again, this idea of moving out from the south, from the east. Blessings and cursings at the end of Deuteronomy. Right, the Lord came from Sinai, dawned on them from Seir, shone forth from Mount Paran, came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones at his right hand. There was a flashing uh, lightning for them. Storm God coming from the south. Right, so the Midianite hypothesis basically says our God, the name that we have for it, is associated with people coming from the deserts, coming from the south and the east, and the Israelites are remembering this tradition. Right, that part of their origin is as a tribal people coming from the south, coming from the east, with some memory of having been oppressed in Egypt. At some point, these people from the south come to Canaan. Sometime after 1219, or sorry, before 1219, not after, before 1219, because Maranatha Stella records it. So that means in the late bronze two to iron one, somewhere around here, a group that identifies as Israel shows up in Canaan, right? It has to happen before 1219, but it can't happen a lot earlier because we have lots of Egyptian texts. We have lots of Egyptian texts about dealing with Canaan. And they deal with Canaanites, lots of Canaanites. You know who they don't mention? Israel. And we know that they would mention them because when they encounter them, they do. Right? So this indicates that there isn't a group called Israel uh, existing much before this period and showing up sometime, again, let's say between about um, 1250 and 1200. Right, start to mid of the 13th century. In fact, around this time, we start seeing changes in the settlement patterns of the land of Canaan, modern day Israel. In the late Bronze Age, we have a couple very large cities. You can see them in white. As we get into the late Bronze Age, too early Iron One, they're replaced by a lot of tiny villages all the green dots. We see a period of de-urbanization, right? Where we're replacing large centralized city-states, which we associate from the Egyptian text with Canaanites, with lots of small villages, small rural agriculturalist villages. As some people say, aha, this sounds like the Israelites, right? So starting in the hill country, and again, our narratives in early Joshua suggest that the Israelites come and they start off in the hills. They start off in these hill areas. And we start seeing these new agrarian settlements popping up in the Iron One. Right, so a shift from large fortified cities to small, unwalled, less densely uh, occupied villages. Our economy is largely subsistence, farming and herding, terracing off general agriculture, um, small family groups. We have certain technological innovations that consistently start showing up in these sites, showing that there's some connection between them, right? That they're doing similar types of developments in terms of farming, cisterns, um, terracing, right? Trying to make the hill slopes flat so you can farm on them. That's what our terracing looks like. Um, we don't have palaces. We don't have large temples. We don't have some of these elite structures we'd associate with our traditional Canaanite occupants. There's things about these societies that look different, that are strong kin-based, clan-based societies. 
who don't like eating pigs. Canaanites don't really like eating pigs very much either, but uh, at least not in the late Bronze Age. But uh, still, we have pig avoidance as a uh, characteristic of this. Um, and then largely abandoned in the early uh, Iron II with a return to urbanism, which is around the time of the rise of the Israelite kingdom, right? Iron IIa would be David, Solomon figures we'll talk about uh, after um, the Thanksgiving break. Uh, and so this would be our movement in the biblical tradition of throwing into a kingdom, right? We want a king, we want big cities, we want to construct them, sort of fitting into that area happening a few hundred years later. These people have different types of houses. The most common one is what we call a pillared house or more traditionally a four room house. This is its layout. You walk in, you have the first room that's kind of got the pillars here, side rooms and a back room. This is not a typical architectural style that we would find in the late Bronze Age and Canaanite sites. It shows up all over the highlands in the Iron One. So some people have called this the Israelite house, right? Associated with a new group of population. It actually starts showing up uh, in modern day Jordan across the Jordan River. But again, there's a tradition of Israel coming across the Jordan, coming from the east, right? Not just coming straight up from the south. There have been some arguments that one example of this building actually shows up at certain sites in Egypt, but that's a little bit uh, contentious for us. And people trying to place Israelites, particularly in Egypt, have looked at that particular piece of architecture, but um, there are some problems with it. It's not quite an exact form, and it's only one house, and it's in an odd place. Um, we also have different types of pottery. They have these giant pithoi, right, with these very thick, uh, heavy rims. They call them collared rim pithoi. They only show up in the highlands at sites that have this type of houses. So we have changes in material culture restricted to certain areas. Uh, here's some kind of hard to read maps, but I'll interpret them for you. Right through here inside the circle are sites that have four room houses. They are abundant in this circle, existent and somewhat common in this area, abundant up here, absent down here. Hollowed rim store jars, right? Mass mapping on, abundant through here, same place, absent on the coast. Remember that our coast is where the Philistines settle. This is not an Israelite place. It's not a place occupied by Israelites, and it is lacking these types of features. Where they are somewhat common but not abundant are the areas that we think Canaanites are persisting. Right, the Canaanites persist in the land in certain types of areas. So we have markers that some people have associated with an Israelite identity that are starting to show up in the highlands of um, uh, Israel sometime around, well, the time of the Marinetta Stella, right? Sometime around 12, uh, 1200 uh, BC. So the question is, how do they get there, right? How are these new populations coming in? And so we have, again, a few models for this. One, and this is the one that we see advocated in the biblical book of Joshua, is conquest. We come in, people are living there, we kill them, and we occupy the land, right? That's a fairly simple model, right? We uh, come somewhere from the east, we destroy a lot of Canaanite centers, and we set up our own villages in their place. Second one says, well, maybe our conquest wasn't quite as violent as we thought, and a bunch of people migrate through, and the borders are open, and people keep flooding in, and eventually there's more foreigners than local people, and they kind of do a slow takeover, right? A demographic transition from Canaanite to something that we're going to call Israelite. There is some conflict with indigenous populations because new people coming over a border. There's going to be some conflict with the people that are living there, but it's not we are coming to conquer. It's a we're just coming in. If we can do so peacefully, fine. If there needs to be violence, so be it, right? And this is sort of our context of uh, back and forth interaction, right? The pastoral nomads uh, generally have a very fraught relationship with people living in cities because people in cities have very firm beliefs on property rights and land ownership, and pastoral nomads don't, um, leading to some conflicts there. And so again, this idea of pastoral nomads, uh, we 
know that they work in cycles. They go and they wander around and they're like, eh, let's settle for a little bit. They settle for a few generations, and then go back to being, right? There's these cycles of nomadism and sedentarism. And so what we're seeing here is nomads settling down in small villages in the hill country. Third option, which has lost popularity, rose out of sort of Marxist theories uh, that basically say we have uh, rich Canaanite overlords and disgruntled Canaanite peasants, and the peasants rise up from inside and overthrow the big Canaanite cities, and they establish their more egalitarian clan-based villages. It uh, is, again, a theoretically Marxist type approach that we have no real evidence for and doesn't explain some of the differences in material culture. But the theory's out there. And so we want to investigate theoretically these models. And so um, early archaeologists were very interested in particularly the biblical model because we finally found something that archaeologists should be good at identifying. You say you came in, you found a giant walled city, and you burnt it to the ground? Yes, this is exactly the type of thing archaeologists should be good at finding. Big walls, burnt destruction layers, massive uh, accounts of destruction. Where are we going? We are going to Jericho. Right, the most famous site that Joshua encounters, first place the Israelites come to when they enter the land, let's burn down the city of Jericho. So early archaeologists come and excavate Jericho, and they find, well, they find some big walls. The problem is those big walls are prehistoric from thousands of years before anyone is placing a conquest. And if we start looking at this period, right, this period that we highlighted as when we think the Israelites are entering Canaan, we can't find evidence of everyone, anyone living at Jericho. We can't find evidence that it's much of a city at this time period. Certainly no big burnt destruction, certainly no giant walls, right? And we had fairly thorough excavations there from multiple people. Early scholars suggested they'd found it. Reevaluation by Kathleen Kenyon, the British archaeologist uh, pictured here, uh, basically showed that all of those conclusions were wrong. And so there's no evidence of massive walls or fortifications from the period of Israelite emergence. Possible we just haven't found them yet. Archaeology isn't perfect. There are multiple sites we've excavated that we know from lots of textual accounts were occupied in various periods and we don't have good evidence from it. But this is the type of thing we would expect to find and we don't. So that's a bit problematic for us. So this is one of the major sites of the conquest model that isn't working. Are there major sites in the north? Right, Jericho's in the south. The largest, most important city-state in the north is the Canaanite site of Hatsor. It's a um, major urban center. It is the largest site in Israel, has the biggest population. Uh, and in fact, it shows up prominently in Joshua that um, basically uh, Joshua captures it, struck its king with the sword. Our king there is uh, by the name uh, uh, Jabin, Yud Beit Nun, right, or Yavin, right? Um, and so he is struck. They struck with the sword those who were in it, devoting them to destruction. Um, there was none left that breathed. He burned hot sore with fire. Good for archaeologists. We like burning with fire. Bad for the people inside it, good for us finding it. Um, and then uh, captured, struck them down, right, as they were commanded. Uh, none of the cities that stood on mounds did Israel burn except Hatzor alone. Right? So here we have this idea that, in fact, this Israelite conquest is not including burning of lots of cities, burning very specific cities. So we go to Hatzor, and Hatzor is burnt around 1200. We just don't know who did it. Could it be Israelites? Possibly. Could it be any of the other random raiding groups that are going around the country at this time? Yeah. Right? We have Egyptian texts that suggest there are multiple violent populations. The Philistines are just arriving and burning things down. So we don't really know who's doing this. Uh, but at some point there, somebody does burn Hatzor down at some time around 1200. So some people have glitched onto this. But what we don't see is all the Canaanite cities in the region being destroyed at the same time. There's no evidence for that. Right? So in fact, we can look um, at a list of 
sites that are listed in Joshua, what is supposedly happening to them, and can we find evidence? And the answer is generally no. Sometimes we do find some evidence, right? We have uh, here uh, a level six at Lachish, was destroyed around 1150. But remember, our destruction of Hatsura is around 1200. So here they're 50 years apart. That's a long time period if it's all happening in this Joshua era conquest. Uh, so we have some problems with our chronology if we want to line up all of these destructions. But in general, we have some issues with the conquest model. We do have some interesting things. Um, Hatsor is mentioned in the 18th to 16th century in other texts from Mesopotamia, from the kingdom, Amorite kingdom of Mari, and they have a ruling dynasty. The title, or the name of the figure in their ruling dynasty is Ibni, which would be the same root as a Jabin or a Yavin, right, that we're seeing as the supposed ruler in the Joshua accounts. So, so uh, who's also the ruler of Hatsor when it shows up again in the judges account. So this idea of a dynastic family name showing up in uh, a place like Hatsor uh, might be a possible memory. We have problems with this, but then we sit here and we say, well, that seems problematic, but is it actually? Because we keep reading the biblical text, we start seeing lists and saying, the Israelites have conquered all these cities, except we get some pretty extensive lists, right? Um, Joshua gets old, the land that yet remains, all the land of the Philistines, less the entire coastal plain, all those of the Geshurites. Well, that's kind of the northern central area of uh, the country, right? Um, the cities of the Philistines uh, in the south, all the land of the Canaanites that uh, belong to the Sidonians, to Afek, uh, this other land. So it's a list of what we don't have. And then in Judges 1, we start with a list of cities that the Israelites failed to conquer. We start reading, and it's pretty extensive. It'd be the equivalent if I sat here and said, well, we conquered the entirety of the east coast of the United States. Well, except for Boston and its suburbs, and New York and its suburbs. Well, and most of New Jersey, and D.C. and its suburbs, and Philadelphia suburbs are saying, well, what did you conquer? You're leaving all of those big cities uh, alone. And so this is a list of all the major cities in northern Canaan that suggests that the Israelites successfully conquer the hill country. And if you remember those maps, where we're finding those small villages. Right, creating what we might call a new Canaan. So according to those lists, the Philistines keep this whole area, the Canaanites keep this whole area, this whole area, this whole area, and Israel is kind of restricted to these hill country sites where we're finding four-room houses and collared rim store jars. Right, and so this is suggesting that our model of conquest in the Bible is even contested within our biblical texts, giving us a um, much more scattered opinion of what comes in. And then we say, archaeologically, should we be looking for destructions at a bunch of cities that clearly weren't conquered, even according to our other texts in Judges? How much of our conquest narrative is ideological versus actually conquering cities? What does conquered mean? Right? And a few cities, they say they do burn them, but for most of them, it says was destroyed, was conquered. And what does that mean, right? We have, uh, we know that there are royal propaganda texts where we claim to conquer all sorts of things. Part of our kingly right to claim conquest when in fact, all we do is threaten, bully, and maybe come away with a draw or a slight victory or someone gives us some bribe money to go away. All right, so what, is they, what does destroy mean? What does, what does happen? We end up with what is clearly in these texts, a large Canaanite population that persists into the um, late Iron One, which is in fact what our biblical book of Judges is going to be about, the existing, persisting Canaanite population. Archaeological terms, we're starting to call this new Canaan, right? This split identity in our land of Canaan, where we have uh, an emergence of one group in the highlands and a different group in the valleys and in the cities, right? We have a rural, non-urban group. We have an urban cosmopolitan group. Uh, the life continuing uninterrupted in our traditional Canaanite strongholds, particularly in the Jezreel Valley and some areas 
in the north and on the Philistine coastal plain. In this sense, we're setting up an urban rural dichotomy between sort of Israelite and Canaanite identities, right? And so again, this is what uh, some of our archeologists are calling then a new Canaan, that there are people who are indigenous that are existing alongside our new incoming group that identifies as Israel. All right, so what are our conclusions from this? Um, if we're looking for direct evidence of our biblical accounts in Exodus and Joshua, we will be um, disappointed, right? That we don't have direct evidence. Um, there is no evidence for Moses or the Israelites in Egypt in any Egyptian text or the archeological record. What there is evidence of are people of Semitic origin coming across the Egyptian border, living in the Eastern Delta, naming cities in this region, uh, and sort of coming in and out as pastoral nomads, right? Um, our linguistic evidence in the Bible, our Midianite hypothesis, suggests that there is an origin of people that identify as Israelites in the south, in the east, in this Seir, Arabia, Midianite, uh, Edomite type area. There's evidence that a group of people called Israel emerges in the highlands of Canaan sometime in the LB2 to Iron 1, around 1250 to 1200 BC, who is not identified in any earlier texts. We know from later texts that they will rise to political dominance. We know that the group known as Canaanites that living there will lose their political dominance, disappear, and not be referenced in our later texts. So we know that there is a political replacement of the population. The exact nature of this process is unclear. It seems to involve some violence and some less violence, um, right? A combination of elements, uh, but the archeological record is largely lacking in corroborating this large scale invasion of Canaan. But again, our biblical text is also slightly ambivalent on what exactly um, goes on during this period. And so that's sort of what, what we're at. That's the position we're at when we're trying to look for um, extra biblical evidence uh, that links us back to Moses and Joshua. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful evening.